Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with Essential Works for Beginners by Chopin. Everything you need to get started listening to this most marvelous of all composers for the piano. Now, listen, everybody loves Chopin. I have never in all of my, like, 50 years in the world of classical music heard anybody who said they don't like Chopin. It's sort of impossible not to like Chopin because his music is just gorgeous. I mean, there's so much melodic wealth and expressive richness and it hits you like straight away. I mean, and, and most of his music is short and consists of shortish character pieces. I mean, it, it's just amazing. He was the first great composer to write exclusively for the piano, almost exclusively. I mean, there are a couple uh, pieces with orchestra, I mean, but with piano, of course, and some chamber works with piano, of course. But basically, everything he did is for solo piano. And it's extraordinary. It's not a large output. He died when he was only in his early 40s or so. He had tuberculosis. He was you know, a sick guy. So, you know, it's, it's, he, he appeared, he did his thing, he dropped dead, and everything he left is marvelous. I mean, yes, there will be arguments about, you know, his handling of large-scale form, for example, in some places and some issues and some works, but basically... You know, I mean, the early stuff is early. Like any budding composer, it's less characteristic. But as soon as he hit his stride, and we're only talking about stride pieces here, it was <clears throat> smooth sailing all the way through. Uh, he was born and raised in Poland. He spent most of his career in Paris, um, in France. Uh, he was famous for having, you know, an intimate affair with the famous uh, authoress, George Sand. You know, female authors all had like American names in those days. I mean, American English names, you know, male names generally, often English names because, you know, apparently England was the home of, you know, butch women or something like that. I don't know, whatever they did. Anyway, George Sand was his girlfriend. Um, she was nuts. He was nuts. They were all nuts. It was very romantic. But let's talk about the pieces that you should have as the basis of your Chopin collection. There are one, two, three, four, five, just six, or six clumps. You know, Chopin was a clumpist. He wrote music in groups of similar pieces. So sometimes I will single one out, but most of the time you're going to get a bunch of them. And so you'll you'll have everything you need to have. We begin we begin with the 24 preludes, opus 28. Now, what is a prelude? Well, a prelude obviously is an introduction to something. These introductions are introductions to nothing. They are standalone works, although you could argue that the 24 preludes which play for about 40 minutes altogether is a single group single work. They are in all of the major and minor keys. And they're extraordinary. I mean, some of them are less than a minute long. I mean, just 30 seconds long. Others of them last about three and a half minutes maximum. Uh, they're remarkably diverse. And I do recommend that you listen to them all in, at one throw. Pianists in the golden age of pianism, you know, in the, in the early decades of the 20th century, um, often just played selections or small groups of them. But they, I, I think the piece comes off best when taken in its entirety. I mean, it doesn't tax your patience. It's just a, a kaleidoscope of amazing tunes. Pay particular attention to number 17 in A flat. It's one of the longest ones. It is so beautiful. It's got a tune that, oh my God, I can't get it out of your head once you've heard it. But it, it, they're all they're all lovely. And uh, it's the, the basic ultimate sort of Chopin piece to get you started. Next, we turn to a work in larger forms, the Piano Sonata Number no. 2, which is in four movements. This is the sonata that has the famous funeral march. You know the funeral march? Da, 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 that thing. Um, it's extremely grim. The whole sonata is extremely grim. The finale is about a minute and a little bit, and it's practically atonal. 
without a basic key, but not bad atonal, like squeak, bloop, eek, ack, not like that at all. It's spooky. It's, 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 it's scary. The whole piece just brushes by. It was, it's been described as, you know, a, a chill wind blowing over the graves in a cemetery or something like that, but it's quick and it's brilliant and it's, it's kind of amazing. Definitely an amazing piece. Um, shattering emotionally and, and as famous as anything. Third, the Polonaise. Now, Chopin wrote sequences of dance music. The most famous batch of them are probably his waltzes, because you have the minute waltz, which is not in this list. But I mean, you know, you might as you'll get the waltzes. You, you know, you, you'll find that these will all come on like single discs or a few discs. The largest number of dance pieces he wrote were his mazurkas which are, you know, are refined versions of Polish folk dancing. And the Polonaises are that too, only they're bigger. They're bigger and they're, 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 they're ballsier. And they two of two of them, there's the military and the heroic, or the heroic and the military, depending on you know, how you order them. The Polonaise in A-flat major. Oh, it's just wonderful. Da, 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 that's the heroic. It's, those are the two big ones. And it's really, really great. I mean, it's it's just it has a very exciting middle section with a left hand going quite difficult. Extremely virtuosic and brilliant and majestic too. I you know, they're the embodiment of of you know the this Polish dance as a national um, characteristic or something like that. There's something sort of patriotic about them that people have picked up on. And if you get the Polonaise in A-flat major, you'll get the other one, the heroic one, and you'll get the whole, probably all seven or eight of them. There were a few published in his lifetime and some published posthumously after he, after he died because he didn't live to publish everything that he'd written. After that, the etudes. The etudes are brilliant. There are two sets of etudes, two sets of 12. Now the etudes sound, it sounds very dry, doesn't it? They sound like, you know, an etude is a study. It's a study in technique. But studies in technique can be many things. I mean, it depends on what technique you're trying to inculcate in the pianist. And so Chopin's etudes are, you know, the great music critic from the UK, Donald Francis Tovey, in the early decades of the 20th century, described Chopin's etudes as completely and totally unique, the only pieces that are at once perfect pedagogical works to, to deal with whatever technique is in question. For example, playing arpeggios up and down the keyboard or, or repeated notes or double, you know, or thirds and various things and positions and twisty hand things and stuff like that, but which are also perfectly gorgeous individual musical masterpieces. They are extraordinary and amazing pieces and delicious and some of them have nicknames and and you know i mean we don't have to get into them all there's the black key etude and there's there's the winter wind and you know it's all it's all very romantic and lots of fun then after the etudes you absolutely have to get some nocturnes well what's a nocturne a nocturne is something nocturnal the nocturne as a piece was invented by the irish composer john field um, and or Scottish or Irish or UK-ish, in, in Russia actually is where he spent most of his career. Um, and he invented the Nocturne, which is just a poetic, simple, song-like work, but it was perfected by Chopin, who wrote a whole slew of them, a couple discs worth of them. Um, and as the title implies, they are moonlit, lovely, lyrical works for the most part. You know, Chopin put, packs as much expression as he can into whatever form he's working with. So, you know, some of them are a little more agitated, some of them a little bit less so. But they all have that basic lyricism, which is the point. And the most famous of them is in the second Nocturne in the Opus 9 series, the Nocturne in E-flat. And the Nocturne in E-flat, I mean, the tune is just beautiful. I mean, Chopin's melody was, was amazing. It's an amalgam, his melodic style of of Italian bel canto melody, for example, from the operas of Donizetti and Bellini, and you know, where you have just, just beautiful outpourings of rich, 
lovely melody and Polish folk music that he grew up with and various other influences like that. But the nocturnes are, are incredibly beautiful. I say that about all this music, though. It's all incredibly beautiful. I mean, Chopin's music is beautiful. That's why everybody loves it. And when you hear the second nocturne, you may sort of have this image of, you know, Liberace sitting at his piano with the candelabra, you know, the whole thing going. And it's, it, we, we have to sort of get away from that image if you regard them as something tacky or kitschy because the music isn't at all. Not a bit. And last but not least... The ballads, or ballades, because they're in French, there are only four, and they are larger works, larger works in, in freeish form. Um, they, a ballad, a ballad tells a story. We don't know what the stories are. We have no idea what exactly Chopin had in mind when writing his ballads, but numbers one and four are two of the most famous piano pieces in existence, and they contain some of his most difficult and virtuosic piano writing, particularly number four. And uh, you'll probably recognize the tunes. In fact, with a lot of this stuff, you'll recognize the tunes. I don't have to go into any detail about them other than to just sort of point you and say, go this way. Now, there's a lot of music that I haven't discussed. There are two piano concertos with orchestra, but they're, they get played constantly, but you'll encounter them. Like I said, Chopin's output isn't huge. So if you like these pieces, then you'll naturally expand into the other stuff. You'll hear the waltzes, you'll hear the impromptus, you'll hear the scherzos, you'll hear the two concertos. They're just, you know, you could, you could almost start anywhere with Chopin and you'd be in very good shape. You just find the things you like the best and take it from there. But if you're building a collection, this is where I'd start with these six individual pieces or groups of pieces. And they will form the nucleus of an absolutely... Uh, comprehensive, um, expressively diverse, and, and wonderfully multifaceted view of this most beloved of all composers for the piano. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care and happy listening to Chopin. You're going to just love this stuff if you don't know it yet. You really are. It's gorgeous. You can hear it all on YouTube, too. You can sample and play with it, and it's, it's easy. Bye-bye.